Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk here. You know, every time I come to a conference nowadays, uh, there's a handful of regulars I recognize, but there are increasingly more people I don't recognize, which is a good thing, I suppose. It tells you the field is really thriving. But it's also a testament to the older generation that, uh, that they've really cultivated this field. And, and seeing all these new, uh, new faces is, is, is really a pleasure. So I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you. Um, so I'm uh, going to talk about higher associative structures on Moore spectra. So this is a joint. Uh, it's joined with Prashid. can never figure out how many T's or how many H's are in there. Is he around here? Is Prashit around? I see his badge out there. OK. OK, great. Thank you. Please correct me if uh, I write it wrong next time around. OK, so let me introduce the, the question at hand. So here's the question. First, well, let's define our terms here. Uh, the, my Moore spectra, I'm going to denote it as mp to the k, is going to be the cofiber of multiplication by p to the k on the sphere spectrum. And, and the question at hand here, the basic question we want to ask is, um, uh, does mp to the k admit a multiplication? So that's the first question. And if so, how associative is it? So, by how associated is it, I mean in the sense of Stashev. So uh, A2 multiplication would mean just a regular multiplication, and A3 would mean a homotopy associative uh, uh, multiplication, um, um, and so on and so forth. There are higher associative structures. OK, so some background on this. It turns out that this is a very old question. Um, goes back uh, to Toda, or maybe even earlier. Um, so what Toda showed in 1963 was that M3 um, is A2, so it has a, a multiplication, um, but not A3. Um, then subsequent work by uh, Cranes, um, and that was 1966, uh, and then taken with work by Kochman uh, from 1972, implies uh, if you took an odd prime, MP is AP minus 1, uh, but not AP. So it seems like the associative structures are increasing as the prime grows. Um, uh, there is a result for the prime two, uh, more recently, that says, so you're increasing the height here, uh, is A3 for k bigger than 1. So as things stood, that was the state of the art. I mean, it seems like it was a difficult question where people really couldn't figure out what the associative structures in the Moore spectra uh, were. Um, and, and what I'll do in a second is introduce uh, a context so that I can sort of talk more about what Prashid did. Uh, so for, to do that, what I need to do is introduce the Moore spectra as Tom spectra. So let's do some, let me just introduce some background here. So let's consider, so we take the fundamental group of the classifying space of the p-local units. Uh, that's just the ring of units uh, for z localized at p. And um, let's say rho is a class. 
uh, and let's say it's represented by an element in this uh, z localized at 3, represented by an integer of the form 1 plus lambda p to the k, um, and say lambda is prime to p. Then you can, you can construct the Thom spectrum for rho. Then it turns out um, the Thom spectrum for rho is um, an, has an an structure, uh, if and only if there exists a loop map. Um, I will call rho tilde that fits into the following picture. So here's my rho. Um, and I can always map S1 into loops CPN. Uh, and I require a loop map like this. So if such um, a diagram exists, and I should add here, it's AN as a Thom spectrum. So you can realize the Thom space of rho, Thom spectrum of rho, as, um, an, as an AN spectrum. Uh, if and only if a commutative diagram like so exists, where this is a loop map. OK. Um, not so hard to show. One way to see it, the easy way to see this, is break up S1 into a push out of S0 into two points, and just pull back that, that bundle. And you see very easily that the Tom spectrum for that uh, row uh, is going to have that form. Um, so, And I should also add, I wouldn't care about this. Um, unless I could identify that Tom spectrum as a Moore spectrum. OK, so this leads us to calculations. So, so where does this lead us? So I want to have a diagram of this form where I have a loop map from loop CPN into BGLS0. So what does this uh, require? This requires a computation. Um, of right because loop maps from here are just simply maps from CPN into uh, B of this expression. I mean, and you think of this as a spectrum. This is the group of interest where uh, these extensions belong. Right. So you want to compute this, which is impossible. For arbitrary n, you just, it's too big, it's too complicated, you can't sit down and compute it. Uh, but what you can do is you can fix an n and try and find lo lower bounds on k. So fix n, increase k, uh, use obstruction theory uh, to find lower bounds um, on k for uh, a VAT fixed N. And so this is what Prashid did. Uh, in his thesis, um, he worked out several uh, examples where he calculated the obstruction and noticed that it vanished for a certain fixed N and a large enough K. Uh, clearly, it wasn't optimal. I mean, you're using obstruction theory, you lose control over this question but you can certainly get some information. So, so I'm going to assume p is, uh, is odd from now on. So everything I'm going to say has some analog for p equals 2. It's uh, slightly weaker, and it leads us astray, because I have to introduce something analogous every single time. So I'm going to set that aside for the sake of time. Maybe I'll say a word about that at the very end. Let's fix an odd prime. And so in light of all of this, it may seem surprising that you could prove a theorem of the following type. Um, so here's the, the statement of the theorem. It says uh, odd p, m p to the k admits uh, a p to the k minus 1 structure as a Tom spectrum. Uh, moreover, this structure, any such structure, does not extend to uh, AP to the K structure. 
Uh, there are obstructions. Uh, the obstructions here uh, is in the image of J and, and sitting inside pi 2 to the k, 2 p to the k minus 3 of m p to the k. So by that I mean you take the sphere of mapping into this and you, um, and you look at the image of J in here, turns out it's just a cyclic, it's a cyclic group of order p in this dimension. And you take the generator of that cyclic group of order p and that's the obstruction to extending it. So it clearly doesn't extend. So that's the statement of the theorem here. Um, so how do you try to prove such a theorem? So let me just outline the approach on how one would prove a theorem of that kind. <clears throat> OK. So I know Mike gave a talk earlier where he said he understood everything about the image of J. I don't. So that's why it took me some time. But here's the approach one can use for this. So let's assume you knew something about the image of J. Assume you could prove a P local um, stable Adam's conjecture. So what do I mean by that? Um, uh, what I mean by that is, i.e., there exists uh, a map, we'll call that J, that goes from HCE, standing for homotopy co-equalizer, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, where, so Q is an integer generating the p -adic units. Um, psi Q is going to be uh, the corresponding atoms operation. And um, HCE of psi Q is the homotopy co-equalizer um, of the identity map and psi Q on the spectrum of connective K theory localized at P. So, so this is a stable Adam's conjecture, right? Adam's conjecture said that such a map existed, just but on the level of spaces. Uh, and, and you have to be careful, co-equalizer, stably, the co-equalizer is um, uh, the, the suspension of the equalizer. So, so uh, if you take the loops on this space, if you take the spectrum, take the loops on this spectrum and look at its zero space, that's just what we call the image of J. Um, so, so, so this is a spectrum here. And one requires a map of this kind. And let's assume that we could calculate the effect of this map on homotopy. And so assume also uh, that J star going from pi 1 of homotopy co-equalizers, uh, the homotopy co-equalizer of this, to pi 1 of uh, BGL S naught localized at P. So this guy is uh, Z localized at P units. Uh, this one is Z, and it sends 1 to Q. Uh, let's assume we could verify that, that this map, this J homomorphism stably, uh, had the property that said the integer 1 to Q. Then what you could try to do is get that map that you're interested in. Remember, we're interested in a map from CPN into the suspension of the spectrum. Uh, we could try to pick that map out, pick that map out over here. That is to say, map CPN into this, which has the right properties down here. So this would be something that's more amenable to computation. Clearly, this guy is impossible to compute. So what you would then do if you could verify something like that, if you could actually 
achieve uh, a stable map of that kind. So then one can identify rho tilde um, as an element in the spectrum HCE1 of CPN. OK, so that's what we'd want to find, uh, such that uh, rho tilde restricts to uh, p minus 1, p to the k minus 1 in um, HCE psi q to the 1, CP1, which is a z. So because 1 goes to q, p minus 1, p to the k minus 1 goes to something which is the form 1 plus lambda p to the k. Okay? So that's this restriction property that I have. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for an element in here that has this restriction to this group z. That's what we're interested in. Now, this is a much easier object to calculate. So one has a short exact sequence. If you work out the short exact sequence, remember, this is a spectrum. It's a homotopy co-equalizer, which is a suspension of the equalizer. So you have a, a short exact sequence So you have a short exact sequence. You want to find out things over here. You just want to find things over here that are fixed under psi q. And that forces rho tilde to be, um, it's the following class, p minus 1, p to the k minus 1, um, beta inverse. And I'll explain these terms. Suspension n going from 1, sorry, i going from 1 to n, 1 minus l to the i. You're truncating the logarithm. You really want psi q to act as 1. So it's clear that the logarithm for the multiplicative logarithm is going to come into this picture. And you can figure out uh, this is the form of the unique class, which goes to 0 under this map. And where are these things here? L is the line bundle, the, the universal line bundle over CPN. Uh, beta is the bot class. So elements of this form are precisely the things that go to 0 here. Um, this, as I have written it, this class lies in, uh, in the periodic k-theory. But you can work out that this class is, in fact, if you look at the class, in fact, is in connective k-theory. So this is the class that does the job, except that now you notice from the formula here, n can't get very large. Because the moment n gets large, you start getting denominators that are not p-local. right? So what this forces n to be is less than p to the n, uh, p to the k minus 1. So this implies n is less than p to the k minus 1. It's just forced on you, because otherwise this class will not be well defined. So that's the proof. That's the approach of the proof of that. Uh, that gives you our theorem. Um, <coughs> of course, it relies on the existence of this map, the stable atoms conjecture. So, so it remains to prove uh, the p-local stable atoms conjecture. So any questions uh, so far? OK, yeah, Jacob. So the non-existence is all that's as a Tom spectrum? Yes, it's all as a Tom spectrum. Yeah. So, so that, that's a good question. I mean, maybe at the end, if I, if I really have it, you know, some time, I'll try to s suggest that maybe this is optimally out for an arbitrary structure, but, but that's still something I don't know for sure. Uh, I have reasons to believe this may be optimal for odd primes. Um, yeah. Should that be i plus 1 in the denominator? No, it's, it, no it's, it's i. Yeah. yeah may, I, maybe I won't be able to recreate why it's i right now, but just this is sort of like the truncation of the logarithm, right? The multiplicative logarithm. So what you can do is take it up to infinity. Just you, know, you can take it up to infinity if you want. You just notice that it'll be 0. So it's a well-defined object up to infinity. Just the higher terms will vanish. And when you apply psi k to it, it multiplies it by, k, uh, by q, 
when you apply psi q to this expression, it multiplies it by q because it's the multiple logarithm. But remember, I'm dividing by the bot class, which also gets multiplied by q. So this expression is invariant under psi q, and therefore 1 minus psi q kills it. So, um, okay, so, so now let me get into the, the heart of the argument on how you prove the, 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 the p-local stable atoms conjecture, okay? So I need to digress here and get into gamma spaces because that's the, um, the main technical tool that you use to prove something like this. Um, so way back, way back in the 80s, Friedlander wanted to prove this theorem. Uh, Eric Friedlander wanted to prove this theorem. Uh, uh, but what, what he ended up proving was a theorem that was a little weaker than this. He, um, he proved the existence of this map after p completion. So he had s naught, but then he p completed both sides. And he proved that uh, using the, um, the machinery of gamma spaces. But notice that you can't do that for our purposes. You can't p complete because the moment you p complete, you kill the fundamental group over here, which you don't want to do. You don't want to kill the fundamental group here because that's the thing that's actually giving you the thumb spectrum. So you, what you want to really do is this. You want a p local version and not a p complete version. So you need to adjust his argument. Um, and so let me introduce the, uh, uh, the players in this, um, in this game start off with some basic definitions that are probably familiar to everybody in this room, or most of you in the room. But I'll say it anyway. So a gamma space is a functor. I'll use the letter B. Um, so here, F is the category of uh, finite pointed sets um, and pointed maps. And I'm going to use uh, simplicial sets as a proxy for pointed spaces because a lot of the arguments one uses uh, later on go better with simplicial sets. So this is pointed. Uh, simplicial sets. OK. Um, I want to make a couple of remarks here. Uh, instead of f, I could work with a smaller category of the, the canonical sets with n elements. So um, the first uh, may work, we may with the category uh, of objects uh, given by um, with, uh, these canonical sets with n elements, uh, with 0 being uh, the base point. Um, it turns out that uh, gamma spaces form a closed model category. So you could do homotopy theory. Uh, in this category, we'll call that F. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples, two or three examples um, of gamma spaces. Um, uh, Let's take the gamma space where, for, an, uh, for the object n, what it's going to do is give you the discrete set of the natural numbers n times. So it's a discrete set of the naturals. Um, so n copies uh, of the naturals. And, and so how does the, the map work? Uh, so the so let's, so I have to give you, uh, I have to identify B as a functor. So if you have a map of between M from N to M, I need to tell you how this works. So, so let's say alpha goes from N to M. Um, and uh, so alpha, it, so B alpha uh, applied to I1, IN is J1. JM. So my functor will, since it's a functor, it should take n copies of the natural and give you n co m copies of the natural. So what I'm going to tell you is how it takes uh, an n tuple of natural numbers and gives you an m tuple. And it's defined as so. Um, J sub s is defined as the sum uh, uh, if alpha inverse of s is not empty. 
and it's 0 if alpha inverse of s is empty. So this is an example uh, of a gamma space, a rather silly gamma space. But the reason I introduced that example is um, because what I want is to focus on those gamma spaces that map to this one. So, so we focus on gamma spaces that map to this. So in other words, I e, I, uh, we want a general gamma space that we're interested in to be um, a disjoint union uh, of all uh, n tuples of natural numbers of things that look like this. So I'm going to focus on gamma spaces that break up. OK? So this leads me to example two. I can define b sub i to be the product. Um, so maybe I should name this b g l r i is the product um, s going from 1 to n b g l i sub s r. So I, r is any ring. r is a commutative. So what I'm doing here is defining a gamma space for you where I'm defining the ith component of that gamma space to be just the product. Remember, i is an n-tuple. Um, so here, i is i1 through is, uh, in. So I'm defining that uh, component to be just the product of the classifying spaces of the, the general linear groups over that ring for that. So you can, it's just straightforward to check that this satisfies the properties of a gamma space. And then one more example that's going to be relevant. So uh, let x be a pointed um, simplicial set. So we'll define b, g, x as a gamma space, where the ith component is going to be like that one, um, uh, b uh, self homo g of the realization of the Eiffel smash product. So here, uh, g uh, <coughs> is uh, the pointed self homotopy equivalences of the realization of the um, smash product of x so many times. Okay. So these are three important uh, gamma spaces, and I really won't need any more than these three, these three examples in what I have to say. But these three examples really give you a flavor of um, what gamma spaces, what examples of gamma spaces are like. OK, so this last example um, is a classifying spaces of self homotopy equivalences of certain uh, spaces. Uh, you know in the classical sense those things classify fibrations with uh, uh, that space as a fiber. There turns out to be a theorem for gamma spaces uh, very similar to that proven by Friedlander. And so let me state that theorem here. Uh, but to define that, to, to give you that statement of that theorem, I need to define what fibrations are because at the end of the day, this will be a universal object that, that uh, classifies those fibrations. So I'm going to give you here a definition. I'm going to put a star here. This definition will not have every single component in its definition. That would lead me astray. I'm going to give, going to give you the parts of this definition that won't create a problem later on in the sense that I would lead me astray in defining terms that, that, that I don't really need. So this is not a complete. This is an incomplete definition. So a map pi um, from two gamma spaces is called an x fibration over b if uh, two properties hold for all um, uh, n tuples of natural numbers, the corresponding map on the component um, are fibrations uh, with 
fibers um, equivalent to the product over S. So you want the fibers to be products of the, the smash products of X's. Uh, I'm not asking for there to be an identification of the fiber with this, just that there is a, there's a homotopy equivalence, abstract homotopy equivalence from the fiber to this object over here. Um, a, there are canonical uh, fiber-wise um, homotopy equivalences over BI. So there are canonical maps that are required to be fiber homotopy equivalences. So let me tell you what the maps are. So this space clearly maps to this. There is a natural map from this to this product. There are canonical maps from BI to each of these singletons. Um, induced by maps of, uh, of finite sets. And then there is a map from this to this, and everything sits over BI. So you want uh, uh, this map to be a fiber-wise homotopy equivalence. And then there are two other criteria that I'm not going to write up on the board. That's the part that makes it incomplete, and that has to do with sections. Remember, these are fiber-wise pointed self-homotopy equivalences, and so what you want is certain compatible sections. And I'm not going to write that part of the definition into this. So that's the definition of a fibration, an X fibration uh, of gamma spaces. And here's the theorem of Friedlander. It says uh, what you would expect. Um, equivalence classes of X fibrations over B are in bijection uh, with um, uh, homotopy classes of maps from B to B, G, X. Okay. So, so this example that I gave you up there is, uh, is a universal space that classifies X vibrations over gamma spaces. Okay, so that's great. I'm going to use that. But before I tell you how exactly one uses that, let's... Um, bring another player into this game. It's a result of Siegel. It's a fundamental result that says, from a gamma space, you can create a spectrum. So let me add that theorem here. Um, it says the following. So let sigma denote uh, the smallest simplicial set representing a circle. So uh, the simplicial set representing S1 with two non-degenerate simplices. So zero simplex and a one simplex. Um, then a gamma space B gives rise to a prespectrum. Let's call that phi of B. Uh, OK. And the space um, phi of B, the prespectrum, uh, at level k is going to be b eval evaluated at the k-fold smash um, of sigma. And this is so this is naturally a bi-simplicial set, right? b itself evaluated at anything as a simplicial set. And this guy is a simplicial set. This is a bi-simplicial set. By this, I mean the diagonal. So you take this bi-simplicial set, look at its diagonal, and that's what I mean uh, by this object here. And if you want a spectrum in the category of topological spaces, uh, just to a geometric realization. Um, and so this gives rise to, to a functor, we'll call that phi, that goes from the homotopy category of uh, these gamma spaces to the homotopy category of spectra. Uh, it just sends b over to phi of b, spectrified, if you will. And it commutes with, uh, uh, it preserves coproducts. It's a nice property of this functor. So Siegel gives you a way of taking a gamma space, creating a functor out of it. And when you apply um, 
Siegel sphincter um, to these examples, you will get what you expect to get. So if R is sort of an algebra, it's a ring without a topology, it'll give you K theory. If you take R to be the complex numbers with its natural topology, you'll get KU, complex K theory. Um, if you take X to be S0 uh, or other, you know, just take it to be a sphere spectrum, you get BGL of S0, et cetera. Okay, so, so the spectrum will be uh, what you might expect it to be when you apply it to these examples. Okay, so how do we use all this? So any questions? Okay, so what I wanna do is use all this to my advantage. Um, so I'm going to construct, here's our strategy. So the strategy is, well, several parts. So we construct um, S2 localized at P vibration. Uh, and this vibration sits over B, G, L, C. So this is just the classifying space. This is the, the gamma space um, where I'm choosing C to have the, the standard topology, uh, the, the, the usual analytic topology. And I'm localizing it. So an S2 vibration over that gamma space endowed with an automorphism. We'll call that psi q. Uh, I call it psi q, well, maybe I should call it psi q tilde because this is an automorphism of this vibration, okay? And it is an automorphism of gamma spaces. So it's an automorphism of an S2 vibration over this gamma space um, that lifts the atoms operation. So it's, it's an automorphism that if you think of it on the base, it's just the atoms operation, psi q. So the next thing you do is the homotopy co-equalizer of uh, psi q tilde and identity on this vibration is another S2 vibration. Over the homotopy co-equalizer of psi q. So what is the homotopy co-equalizer? I mean, it's just a mapping telescope. You just take the, the gamma space, cross it with the identity interval, and identify the two endpoints. Okay, that's all the homotopy co-equalizer is. So what I have is a vibration, uh, an S2 localized at P vibration. I have an automorphism of that vibration. So if I do the identification on that vibration, it sits over the corresponding base with the same identification and gives you another S2 localized at P vibration. Okay, so I get a new S2 localized at P vibration. I can classify it, right? So, so classify this. So, so you can now see what's going on. Uh, so this implies we get a classifying map of gamma spaces. Um, from the base, and the base of this new S2 vibration is the homotopy co-equalizer of psi q. So you get a map from this uh, to B, G of S2 localized at P, right? This is the gamma space where X is chosen to be S2 localized at P. And now apply uh, Siegel's functor uh, and check it does uh, the right thing on pi one, right? You apply Siegel's functor, uh, phi commutes with coproducts, and so if you, if you apply phi to this, you'll get the co-equalizer of psi q on the corresponding spectra. Over here, the spectra is connective k-theory, so the co-equalizer the co on connective k-theory maps to this, and it has the right property. You get the stable atoms conjecture. Okay, so, so I'm giving you sort of the strategy step by step. I'm left to telling you how do I construct this vibration with the automorphism, right? That's the only thing that's left. Questions? Okay, so here's where some algebra comes in, and perhaps that's why simplicial sets were beneficial. The end of some atoll homotopy theory comes in. It goes back to Friedlander, Mislin, back even to Sullivan. Okay, so. 
All right, so, so I'm going to say w is going to be the bit vectors. So well, first of all, let's, what's q? So uh, pick q a prime such that uh, q generates zp star. Yeah. It took me maybe half an hour to figure out that you can find a prime that does the job, but it's true. It's, it's a straightforward exercise in analytic number theory. I don't know what it's called. It's somebody's theorem that if you take an arithmetic progression and a and p are relatively prime, then they're infinitely prime, infinitely many primes in that progression. What's that theorem called? Dirichlet's theorem, right. So you invoke that theorem, and you see very easily that there is uh, always a prime you can find that generates the, the, the units uh, in zp star. So you pick that prime. Uh, would define the, the vit vectors over the closure of this and fix an embedding of rings, you can do that. Okay? You can always find an embedding of w inside c. OK, here are two definitions uh, motivated by what um, Friedlander did. I'm going to define two pushouts. I'll take the this is Eiffel product of w and define this to be the 2i sphere on w, OK? Why do I call this the 2i sphere? Because I call it in analogy with the, the, uh, the, the topological version, which says that if you take the push out of the complex numbers minus 0, you get something that's homotopy equivalent to the 2i the sphere. OK, so these are two definitions. Um, Right? I mean, if you take 0 out, you get the homotopy type of a sphere, and you're pinching off the sphere. So what you're getting is the one-point compactification of ci, which is s2i. OK? So you have these two objects. What I can do is look at the action of BGL of w on the first one, and I could do the associated bundle construction where BGLW acts on this uh, push out on that uh, on the W sphere, so get a vibration. So we get a vibration of this form, B, G, L, I, W. And this is just my notation here. It's, the, it's a vibration with this fiber sitting over B, G, L, I of W. Now, this vibration comes with a Frobenius acting on it. Um, So the Frobenius action on FQ bar lifts to an action on W, and, and then that uh, extends to an action on this associated bundle construction, lifting the Frobenius acting on the space. So I have this vibration, with fiber being this. I can p-complete this, and it turns out one of the, the magics of uh, uh, atoll homotopy theory is that when you p-complete this, you get the, the p-completed vibration for the complex numbers with its standard analytic topology. So this vibration. Um, this p completes to um, but now since we are p completing and that's a functor, I get automorphisms like so, but on the p completion. So this is not p-localization. This is p-completion. So the last step is a certain fracture square. What you need to do is to create a fracture square. So then leads to a fracture square. And here's the fracture square I'll tell you. And of course, there is work that goes into showing how things are compatible. All the, the, you know, everything has an action of these operators, but you want to make sure in the fracture square everything is compatible. So, so here's the fracture square. The corner here is the definition of this object. And it is what it is. It's the pullback of the p-completion here. This object comes with psi q. Um, this is the rationalization of the p-completion. This also has a psi q. Um,
You, for this, you can choose the model that has to do with the normalizer of the maximal torus. Since you're rationalizing, you might as well restrict GLI to a smaller group, which has a natural automorphism that commutes with everything. So I have a model here. Since I'm working with rationalization, I can re re replace this by a smaller group. And so there is a, there's an obvious psi q tilde. Again, these are all, this is a diagram of, of spherical vibrations. And that diagram sits over another diagram of just the bases. But the point, what this does, is that shows you, because everything is compatible, we get the automorphism, the local automorphism that we were seeking. So that's the definition of the gamma space that is endowed with an automorphism. And that automorphism, if i is chosen to be 1, then on the S2 fiber, it's just degree q. That automorphism has the right degree on each fiber. Um, so it's a fiber-wise automorphism with, with the right degree. And, and then that gives us our, uh, so ends up giving us our gamma space. with the automorphism. So I'll stop here, because uh, to leave five minutes for questions, if you have any. Yeah? What goes wrong with the prime two? Uh, nothing really goes wrong, per se, with the prime two. Uh, there is. Um, what does happen, firstly, is that uh, the, units, um, the units are not generated by one class, right? I mean, they're not cyclic. There's a plus or minus one, so you have to worry about uh, that. But then the other problem is what's image of J, right? Image of J is not a fixed points of BU. It's something else. And it's known that you cannot have a stable atoms operation acting on BO. So you cannot have an extension from the homotopy co-equalizer of side 3 acting on BO, extending to BGL. Such a thing cannot exist. It's already known. So, so, so on the one hand, you're working with BU, and you can do everything with BU, but the result is not going to be the image of J. But now, if you're interested in the image of J, that cannot be made to, have a, to satisfy stable atoms conjecture. So you have a compromise where you're replacing the image of J by the automorphism of psi 3 on BU. And, and so you get a weaker result. And ends up, the, the weaker result is m2 to the k plus 1 is a2 to the k minus 1 for k bigger than 1. So that's the result. But it's, I'm not claiming that, that there's an obstruction to uh, extending this to a2 to the k. Because the obstruction is measured by image of j, and I don't have control of the image of j, over the image of j at the prime 2. So, so it, this is the, 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 the weaker result for the prime 2. It's possible it can be extended. I just have to think through that. Yeah? Yeah, that's where you're getting this from. So, it has to be, because it's all in the image of J, and the image of J is a sickly group of order P. So if you cannot extend it, the obstruction must be a non-zero element, and it's in the image of J. So there is you know, up, to, up to a choice of ZP star. There's only one. I mean, it's just something stupid. It's not deep. You know you can't extend it, so, the image, so you have an obstruction. It's in the, in the image of J. Image of J is a ZP. Yeah. What's your thought about whether this is optimal without the time space construct? That's a, yeah. So, OK. <laughs> Let me say the following. Let me say the following. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I have reason to believe the answer might be optimal in the, uh, in the, the, prime, in the odd prime case for the following reason. So, so let's look at THH of HZ mod P to the K. Right? This has an A-infinity structure, and it's unique. OK? So um, sorry. H, Z mod P to the K has an A-infinity structure that's unique. And you can check, though it was not known, uh, this turns out to be a Tom spectrum. H, Z mod P to the K ends up being a Tom spectrum. It's not very popular. It's not known, but, but it turns out that it is. And here's what it is. There's a, so you can calculate THH, and it turns out to be the, the, the it, cohomology smashed with a certain space. And what is FK? 
Uh, FK is a pullback. So this is your usual vibration, the connective cover vibration. So if you consider this pullback by a degree p to the k minus 1 map, you get a space. And that space is precisely the space you get when you take THH of, of this guy. Uh, easy to see why this is the case. If you loop this, this, uh, this section, the, the k invariant vanishes. And uh, you get this when you loop it. And, and, and then you know, you, the results of Mohawald and several other people saying that this thing supports a thumb spectrum that gives you HZ mod 2. Uh, really breaks down to saying that over this you get HZ, and over this you get the Mohr spectrum. So when you smash them together, you get HZ mod P to the K. So this is the proof. But the, the interesting thing here is if K is 1, if K equals 1, then what I can do is I can look at mod P cohomology of this. And if, um, so there's clearly a, a map from TH. So let's assume that the Mohr space, um, so this is K equals 1. Let's assume the Mohr space. Uh, had an AP structure. So you could construct this skeleton, THHP, and then you can map it into this, and you look at the mod P homology, what, what this map does in mod P homology, and you'll notice that uh, it forces certain differentials on the Boxtet spectral sequence for this guy because of the, the fact that this guy can't support too many differentials in homology. This is just a divided power algebra. It's a trunk, it's a, it's a, if you look at the mod P homology of this, it's just there's a Z mod P in every degree up to P to the K. So it has nowhere, the differentials have nowhere to go. But you know that when k is equal to 1, there is a differential d p minus 1 supported on this. So this guy here supports a d p minus 1, and that prevents uh, such a space from existing. So that's the obstruction theory for k equals 1 that shows that this thing cannot support an AP structure. OK, now this obstruction theory fails horribly when k is bigger than 1. If you actually look at the homology of this spectrum here, there are no differentials. So this higher Massey product, that's what this differential is, this higher Massey product doesn't exist in the mod p homology of this spectrum. But if you look at the space here and identify the space, the bar spectral sequence that starts off from the loops on that space converging to this sits inside the Bokstad spectral sequence for this. Okay? And if you look at that bar spectral sequence just for this space with arbitrary homology, let's say Morava K theory, the height 1, you see a dp to the k minus 1 on it. You don't see it in homology, but in the bar spectral sequence, uh, so converging to k1 star of fk supports a dp to the k minus 1. Okay? So if you if you could identify, so what, what, what I'm suggesting is that the right thing to look at would be THH of KU mod P to the K. So this thing has an A-infinity structure. And you get this A-infinity structure by taking the A-infinity structure of the Mohr space up to a certain point and then extending it as a KU algebra. You can always do that. And since it's evenly graded homotopy, you can construct an A-infinity structure on this object by just taking the, whatever the Mohr spectrum gives you and then extending it forward. So you will get a map from THH of a purported p to the k structure of m p to the k into this. And what you would like to say is that the k1-based bar spectral, well, the, the Bokstad spectral sequence for this object supports a d p to the k minus 1 that would give you the obstruction that you want, because I can see that happening in just this space. Now, of course, this is not a proof, because this thing screws everything up. And there's no reason to believe that this space or its bar spectral sequence can be identified inside the Bokstad spectral sequence of this. But I know that this space behaves in the way I want. The higher Massey products are detected in K1, but not in homology. So singular homology doesn't detect these higher differentials, but it but K1 does. And so you'd like to say that this is the, the spectral sequence you want to run with K1-based spectral sequence to detect the, the differential. And you have reason to believe that that differential should exist because of this guy sitting in here. And that would give you an obstruction to a P to the K structure.